Hey everyone, welcome to the Chronically Fearless vlog. It's Tasha. Today, um, I am going to show you guys a get ready with me video. Kind of get ready with me. I'm not a makeup vlogger, so I did the best that I could. But <laughs> um, it's just me basically getting ready for a day um, to go out and do what I do. But um, you'll also hear a voiceover of my diagnosis story. I'll be reading partly from um, my previous vlogs that explain, explain my diagnosis story from nine years ago. I was diagnosed nine years ago. Um, and everything that happened, how it happened, and just how I feel about where I am today. I feel like this is important to do because my fearless day just passed. And um, I just wanted to express to people how I felt then and how I feel now and the woman that I am now with MS and how it changed my life um, for the better in a lot of ways. Um, of course, no one wants to have an illness, but I feel like it's really shaped me um, into the person that I am. And I have no regrets. I have... You know, um, I'm not worried about what the future holds anymore. And I just want you guys to be able to, um, you know, hear my feelings. And given the fact that when I started this vlog, everything was written, I wanted it, you know, to happen in my voice and, you know, everything I... I want you guys to feel the emotion, basically, um, as opposed to reading it on my vlog. And because I have so many new followers now, new subscribers to my YouTube page and all of that, I just want you guys to feel a glimpse of what was going on at that time while watching me, you know, get all cute. So, stay tuned. My name is Tasha. It was September 30th, 2011, and I was in my senior year of college. While many of the people I knew were completing grad school applications and starting internships, I was taking my very first all expenses billed to my insurance ambulance ride. Exciting, right? Wrong. During the weeks leading up to my ambulance episode, I wasn't feeling like myself at all. In just three weeks, it was like something had taken over my body. What I brushed off as stress was actually about to change my entire life. It all started in my advanced physiology class. As I was taking notes, my hand became extremely stiff. So stiff that the pen fell out of my hand. Surprised and confused, I shook my hand out and attempted to grasp my pen again. Not only did my hand stiffen again, but I couldn't grip the pen at all this time. I sat there wrestling with my hand and my pen for about five minutes, until I noticed the guy next to me staring at me like I was some sort of witch. I decided to take a walk, and when I returned to class, it was gone. The bad part? I wrestled with my hand at least twice a day for the next three weeks. My handwriting changed from beautiful script to second grade chicken scratch, and I somehow assumed that it was some sort of weird cramp that would eventually go away. You're probably wondering why I didn't go and get checked out. Let's just say I thought I was Superwoman and therefore invincible. Crazy, right? As if fighting with my hand every day wasn't bad enough, my speech began to slur a week later. Anyone who knows me knows I talk a lot. Only now when I spoke, no one understood me. I could understand everything I was saying, but it was gibberish to everyone else. I found myself repeating everything and having to speak extremely slow in order to be understood. A simple, hey y'all, to me, sounded like <laughs> to everybody else. Not only was my hand acting crazy, but I also sounded crazy. 
Once again, I brushed it off and went about my business. Over the next week, I began experiencing extreme fatigue. Everyone has arrived late to class once or twice. You might hit the snooze button too many times or stop to get a snack. Try waking up 45 minutes after your alarm because you literally don't hear anything. And when you finally get up, you're still exhausted. That was me. There's nothing like walking into class 50 minutes late and getting the death stare from your professors. Oh yeah, did I mention that my morning classes were only 75 minutes long? Most people just don't show up at that point. But your girl kept making that walk of shame into class each and every morning. Shameful. After about a week, my, my physics professor pulled me aside to see if everything was all right. To this day, I am sure he assumed I was on drugs because of the nonsense that came out of my mouth when I responded. I told him that I hadn't been feeling too well and I would try my best not to make the lateness a habit. So much for that promise, because this continued over the next week. I continued to walk into class almost an hour late looking as crazy as ever. At this point, you're probably wondering why someone didn't drag me to the hospital. It wasn't anyone else's fault but my own because I continued to behave as if I had it all together. Soon, I started to feel extremely dizzy every time I stood up. My coordination was thrown off so much that it felt like permanent drunkenness. Don't believe me? Ask the tree that I walked into that week. Yes, a tree. I finally told myself that if I didn't get checked out soon, someone would probably try to have me committed. So I decided that once midterm exams were over, I needed to get to a doctor's office. Why did I think that I could push through exams being the stumbling, babbling, dizzy person I had become? I wish I had an answer to that question. The next week was even more of a blur. The entire left side of my body began to tingle on and off. My whole left side, from head to toe. This was the point I thought that I was literally going crazy. I still managed to push through exams and continued attending work and meetings all while my body seemed to be turning against me. On the morning of September 30th, I woke up feeling a little better, but I was very worried. I prayed that my doctor would be able to figure out what was wrong with me. As I got ready for work that day, I said, Tasha, get it together. You have too much on your plate right now. Don't mess it up. I was giving myself a pep talk, but sadly it didn't work. I arrived at my job at the university's daycare that morning and sat at my desk. I wasn't there for too long when I began to feel like I was going to pass out. Then, something in my brain told me to call my parents. I called my mother first and then my dad. My dad told me to hang up, alert my boss, and have her call 911 as quickly as possible. My mother assumed that I was in my apartment and immediately contacted my best friend, who was also my roommate at the time. She asked her to check on me, and when they realized I had gone to work, it took all of two seconds for my mother to enter panic mode. Before I knew it, she and my dad were speeding frantically down I-695 to meet me. I know what you're thinking. Tasha, all the signs were there. Why did you wait so long? You guessed it. I don't have an answer to that question either. Meanwhile, at the daycare, I went into my boss's office and asked her to call 911. I collapsed in one of her chairs and started to feel even more disoriented. Soon, I was laying on a gurney, headed to the hospital. So this is what I like to refer to as the denial stage of the onset of my MS. I had so much going on at the time with school, extracurricular activities. I was the president of my school's African Diaspora Club. Um, it was senior year, so you know all that that entails. I was, at the time, attempting to plan my parents' 20th anniversary dinner that ended up never happening due to everything that took place after this. And I just would not let anything stop me almost. I was in some of the hardest classes of my program, advanced physiology, immunology, all these things. And I just, it's almost like I was fighting with my body. I was like, no, you're not about to do this. And um, I lost. I lost. <laughs> and at the time, I was just like, no, nothing's wrong with me. Well, not nothing's wrong with me, but I just thought it was something little, something small that I could just take care of later because I had too much to do. And because I'm already a very, I love to sleep, you know, I'm a sleepy person. 
the fatigue is something that I really didn't notice. Sometimes to this day, I have trouble realizing when I'm seriously fatigued versus when I'm just being sleepy Tasha. But um, this is um, one of the experiences that made me realize how important it is to know your body. Um, because something can be terribly wrong, um, which was terribly wrong with me. And you don't realize it until it's too late. And thankfully for me, there was someone there who was my boss at the time who was able to call an ambulance, able to let me lay in her office and all those kind of things. And that I am someone who's blessed with parents, a best friend, who were there to rush me to the hospital and take care of me, basically. Um, what was going through my head at the time, like when I realized, hey, something's going on, I don't know. I think something in, in me at that time still thought, I'm going to be back home tonight. And as you'll see, I was extremely wrong. When I arrived at the hospital, I was brought in in a wheelchair and left in the lobby area while the EMTs gave the receptionist my information. For a few minutes, I stared at the floor wondering what would happen next. Was I going crazy? Was I dying? Or both? Then I looked up and saw my best friend Aisha enter the emergency room. As soon as I saw her, I started crying like a baby. Correction. I started bawling. And when I bawl, it's never pretty. Eyes red, lips dry, and snot running. I looked up and saw her trying to console me. As she rubbed my back and tried to stop me from crying, a nurse arrived to lead us to the room for my examination. A few minutes after we got to the room, my parents arrived. After expressing their worry and fear, I received the first of a series of lectures that would continue for the next month. I called this the Know Your Body Lecture. I received a lengthy lecture from my parents that day, and then one from every aunt, uncle, and parental figure that I could think of. I must admit that I definitely gave them a good reason. My 5'4", 112-pound body, yes, I'm very petite, was laying in a hospital bed, struggling to remain awake and alert after experiencing extremely debilitating symptoms. I can only imagine how scary the view of me in that bed was for Aisha and my parents. Soon, an ER doctor came into the room to speak with us. After examining me, she reminded me of a huge thing that may have caused my symptoms. I had an abscess the size of a strawberry under my arm. I was feeling slight pain under my arm, but I guess my symptoms got so bad that I didn't notice that the abscess had grown larger and more painful. The doctor said that they would surgically remove the abscess in the morning before running any additional tests. She wanted to be certain that the abscess was not the cause of my symptoms. As soon as she said that, my father decided to turn her notion into a fact. Just like that, my father assumed that the removal of the abscess would stop the symptoms. He even told us about a friend who had an abscess in his inner ear and went completely crazy until doctors removed it. I watched him talk, and in my head I thought, there is no way that a giant bump under my arm would have literally had me tripping like this. I listened to him talk about it and nodded my head, but somehow I knew that the removal of the abscess was not going to change anything. It was just like an episode of Law & Order when they think they found the criminal, but you know that the case isn't solved because you're only 15 minutes into the episode. Overcome with fatigue and dizziness, they removed the big, inflamed, strawberry-sized abscess from my underarm the next morning. As I predicted, nothing changed. While I was still barely conscious, several tests were completed on me, one of which was an MRI, the first of many that would be conducted on me over the next year. It was now October 1st, 2011. I still didn't know what was wrong with me, but it was the day that I learned about the angels on earth that surrounded me in the form of my family and friends. When I woke up from the anesthesia late that morning, I was welcomed by more family and friends. My mother could not stand to leave me in my condition in a cold hospital room in Towson, so she stayed overnight with me in the room. Aisha not only bought my mother food, but she also came back with clothes and toiletries for her for the night. I always knew that I had a great support system, but it melted my fatigued little heart to see them all in action for me. My doctor arrived that morning with my test results. At that moment, I learned that I could have one of three conditions, vitamin D deficiency, Bell's palsy, or multiple sclerosis, MS. Unfortunately, we wouldn't know for sure until I completed more tests. Once the doctor left the room, the denials and assumptions began. 
One person said with confidence that I couldn't possibly have MS because it was a white person's disease. I had no idea that this statement would ring in my ears for the next several hours as relatives called and texted me. I heard it from at least three other people before the day was over. It was like people wanted to convince me and my parents that the doctors were somehow making it up. I remember learning about MS in middle school and only seeing pictures of white people in wheelchairs. Was it true? Was it a white person's disease? I have to admit that I actually started to believe what others were saying. That night, I was discharged, but still too ill to return to my apartment on campus, so my parents took me home. When I got home, I pulled out my phone and researched the white people's disease. I nearly scared myself to death looking at videos and pictures of paralyzed people that night and realized that it was time to go to bed. The next day, visitors came to see me at my parents' home, and I heard even more theories. By the way, I forgot to mention that I am African, Sierra Leonean to be exact, and it is in our culture to think that we know more than doctors sometimes. It's safe to say that I heard a lot that day, enough to make me realize that MS was not just a white person's disease. Whatever was wrong with me had nothing to do with an abscess, how much meat was on my bones, how much spinach I ate, or my race. It had everything to do with God's plan for my life, and I believe that he wanted me to trust him and watch everything play out. So I ignored everyone else's assumptions for a while and decided to listen to G.O.D. and my doctors. This phase of my diagnosis story is what I would like to call the shock and um, eventual understanding phase and sadness phase. Um, during this phase, I was in the hospital, I got discharged, and my mom nursed me to health for a couple, um, for some days before I returned back to school. She woke me up early every day, shoved yogurt in my mouth, and did everything that the doctors <laughs> told her to. Um, but at the same time, my mind was racing just with everything that I thought MS would be, because out of everything, that's the one thing that stuck in my mind, of the three things that the doctors said that I might have, only because I learned about it a bit in middle school, and um, the craziest part was, it seemed like it was showing up everywhere. And something about me, I get signs a lot when something's about to happen to me, and it was like um, an episode of Law and Order that I remember being really scared of, kind of, because the lady had MS and she could only blink her eyes. That's how debilitated she was. And I remember watching Say Yes to the Dress. And um, the mother and the daughter had MS and she had a sister who had MS and died because of complications. So it was everywhere around me. And I literally had no idea what to do. And then in the meantime, in the interim, I was taking tests. I had a spinal tap done, an EEG, all sorts of things just for them to figure out if I had it or not. Because MS is something that, you know, there's no one test that can determine whether or not you have it. So it was a long, I want to say, two weeks that I had to go through all of this until I finally received a call from my doctor, Dr. Carter. It was now Friday, October 14th, 2011. What do you get after three weeks of crazy symptoms, two MRI scans, one EEG, several blood tests, one spinal tap, and maybe 1,800 pounds of yogurt? Don't know? Okay. I had endured about three weeks of numbness, weakness, and all-around craziness. I had also undergone exactly two weeks of testing. Now all that I could do was sit and wait for an answer. I had only been back in my apartment for about an hour when my phone began to ring. It was Dr. Carter. Hello, am I speaking with Tasha? This is she. Hi, Dr. Carter. I received the results from your MRI scan that you completed today, and the inflammation in your brain has gotten worse. I would like to get you started on steroid treatment immediately. Wait, <laughs> Dr. Carter, I don't understand. I've already submitted a prescription for you. I need you to schedule an appointment immediately for them to administer your five-day treatment. Five-day treatment for what? What are you telling me? Do I have it? My doctor was calling me to tell me that I needed immediate treatment because the inflammation in my brain was getting worse. Her tone was extremely frantic as she told me about my MRI. I'm still very thankful that I was laying down when I answered because I might have passed out. I didn't even know what I had yet and it had already gotten worse. Dr. Carter? I believe so, my dear. 
I need to give you my official report. Can you and your parents come in this Tuesday? Silence. This is it. I'm going to end up in a wheelchair for sure, I thought. What did I do? Why was God punishing me? Tasha? Tears. I'm so sorry, Tasha. I apologize for alarming you. I would just like for us to tackle this as soon as possible. Please try to get some rest, sweetie. I will have my nurse contact you about the Tuesday appointment, okay? Silence. Tasha? Yes. And there it was. It was official. MS was my diagnosis. Now what? What do you do after being told something like that? Before this moment, I always wondered how doctors had the ability to tell patients and families about severe diagnoses or death. How do you tell a patient or their loved ones that their lives are about to change forever? Just the thought of the conversation makes my stomach turn. I'll tell you one thing though, these conversations should never happen over the phone. I'm sure that my doctor never intended to tell me about my diagnosis over the phone. I was actually more concerned about how startled she was by my test results. So startled that she dropped this huge ticking MS bomb on my head through a phone call. The phone call that changed my life. After that phone call, um, I began my true MS journey. Um, not just experiencing the onset, but actually beginning steroid treatment going through what would end up being about four different medications. Um, I went through a series of extreme just fatigue, sadness, loneliness. Not fatigue from the MS because I honestly stopped experiencing symptoms at the time, but I was just ridiculously sad at the condition I was in afraid of the unknown, what the future would hold, and I just had no idea what was about to happen with me. Would I still get married? Would I still have children? Would I still be able to go to medical school, which was my dream at the time? And, you know, what what was going to happen to me? And the biggest question, of course, would I be in a wheelchair? At that time, I had no idea I would create a whole blog, vlog about this, that I would be telling people. I remember telling numerous family members, I'm not about to be the poster child. Don't tell everybody I have it. I don't want to hear nothing. And that was kind of the end of it. Um, and I was determined to not let it take over, but at the same time, I was almost trying to ignore it, which was bad. Um... And when I decided to start this blog, it was about five years post-diagnosis, and I realized, hey, like, I'm good. I'm still walking, talking, doing most of my normal activities, so why fight it? Why not share it and show people the woman I am and how I'm still thriving? And this is here, who you see here today, um, and all I can say is that I hope that this diagnosis story is encouragement for any person who was recently diagnosed with anything, whether it's MS, whether it's cancer, whether it's a thyroid issue or anything chronic that, you know, there's hope after diagnosis and that so many different things happen can happen, whether they're sad or whether they're good, and that you really are going to be okay and to have faith and to be fearless. I know I'm getting so emotional, but I do hope that this video is a true testament to what this vlog stands for, which is to be fearless and to stay fearless. Stay tuned, guys. Thank you.